Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game live on Twitch, on the air with no engine uh, and no libraries. So really, um, you know, you could say that this is, is the whole package. This is the complete game. This is every last little drop of gaming goodness. Nothing hidden, you know, nothing squirreled away, uh, you know, behind the curtain. It's all here in the raw. Uh, and what we did yesterday, uh, due to the fact that there was a, a regrettable incident on the train, is we decided to do something lighter and fluffier than we had planned on doing. So we decided to do some work on ground rendering and play around with that a little bit. Uh, and so what I would like to do today is just maybe finish up a little bit of that ground rendering because we were kind of having fun with it yesterday. Uh, and uh, so we'll just finish that up. Uh, maybe today and, and uh, do a little bit, maybe uh, clean up tomorrow. And then next week we'll start back on collision detection stuff that we wanted to clean up. Uh, really it's collision detection logic that we were sort of working on, where the ground was, that sort of stuff. So let's go ahead and, and do that. Before I open up the code, I'd just remind everyone that if you are trying to follow along at home and you pre-ordered the game on handmadehero.org, you should have gotten a link in your email. That link has a zip file in which you will find all the day's source codes. Uh, and if you look, today is day 82, so you can unzip day 81's source code if you want to play around uh, with the same stuff that I am playing around with today. You'll be at the exact same point uh, that I am. So let's take a look uh, at where things were. Uh, so if we go ahead and run this here, I think where we stopped, yeah, we just kind of made a little thing that would splat out the ground there. You can kind of see uh, where it is. Uh, we're still drawing some things in there like our room boundaries. I suppose we should probably turn that off. Uh, but the other thing that I pointed out was because we didn't have any optimizations on um, our bitmap splitting, you know, it gets very slow to put that background in there, right? Uh, so that's something else that we can kind of think about a little bit. Uh, so you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and just turn off that, uh, those debug boundaries since we don't care about those at the moment. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, I'll go ahead and toggle those off. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so we've got draw rectangle calls uh, where we're drawing those, um, let's see here, actually I think it's push rectangle calls, uh, where we were sort of putting those boundaries in there. Uh, so we had our, uh, our push outline, so this, this right here. Uh, we really don't want to do that at the moment uh, because I don't really want to see those blue lines. Those are just there for our debug purposes, so I'm going to get rid of them and so uh, we can just look at the stuff that wasn't the blue lines. So. I guess what I wanted to kind of do here is I wanted to kind of take a look at, first of all, I, I sort of suggested when someone in the, in the post stream had said, you know, well, what, what would we do when we want to start speeding this up? I was saying, well, I'd probably do something where we would have some kind of uh, backing tiles where we would draw the background once and then just blit out of that so that the constant sort of splatting of things that we use to make these patterns wouldn't be causing a huge problem in terms of performance every frame. We'd just do that compositing on the fly in little like sort of sections. Uh, and so that's something that we could consider playing around with. That sound, kind of sounds like a fun thing to do. The other thing that it would be, uh, that we kind of need to figure out how to do is, well, if we want to have multiple layers of things, uh, like which is kind of where we started down this, why we started down this path, if we want to have multiple layers so that there's you know an upper floor and a, a, da a lower floor like we were kind of doing here, because remember we, we still have this sort of notion of, of two floors uh, worth of content there as you can go up our sort of virtual stairwell here that we have no graphics for yet. Um, if we wanted to make those two different floors and start to think about like where these, these things go, we need some concept of that, right? We need some way to make that work. So that's sort of one thing that we should probably think about. And like I said, I'm not 100% sure what it is that we really want to do. So that's on the table. What I'm going to start with, because it's the easiest thing, is what I'm going to start with is just cleaning up the random number situation a little bit, right? So I'm going to clean up that random number generator situation just a, just a tad, uh, because I kind of said we should probably do that uh, at the end of the stream before, and you know, we, we left it uh, sort of in a, in a bit of, of, uh, of a nasty state. You can see I got this to do right here, make random number generation more systematic. So I think I'm gonna take a second just to do that. And again, this will also set us up for later on when we wanna actually talk about random number generation where we replace uh, this random number table with an actual random number generator, which would be good. So you can see there's really no code right now in the random number generator, it was just a table and we were just sampling directly out of the table. So what I'd like to do 
is I'd like to pull out this code that we've been using many times and I'd like to turn it into something that I can just use anytime I want. Again, straight up compression oriented programming here, just trying to condense down uh, some of these things that uh, you, you've seen happening a bunch of different times. So what I'd like to do is introduce the concept that people can have a stream of random numbers uh, that they can access and uh, make some of these ways in which we're using them. Like the, you know, down here we were trying to get a number between zero and one, for example, and then we were turning it into a number between negative two and one and all that sort of stuff. I'd like to sort of uh, make that stuff more systemic uh, so that when people want to use, and by people I mean me, but you know, when we want to go use the random number generator to generate randomness for us, uh, we will be able to easily get the types of randomness we want out of it without having to think through the math every time, right? Uh, so, <clears throat> what I'd like to point out, uh, first of all, is that we don't typically know up front uh, very much uh, about how the people want to use these random numbers, right? Sometimes when you want to use random numbers, you would like to, them to be sort of effectively random, right? So when you're asking for a random number in the code, sometimes you want it to be really completely random or at least as close to that as possible or indistinguishable from random, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but other times what you want is a series that has the properties of randomness, but that actually is completely predictable, right? Uh, and the reason that I say this is because if you think about uh, how we might want to do things, let's suppose uh, that we generate a whole world right, uh, out of randomness. So we're going to create a random, random world for the player to play through. But we would like to, the, the player to be able to send some small piece of information to his friend that that friend could enter into the game on their computer to play through that same random world, right? And now the random world we generated might have been hundreds of megabytes worth of stuff, but we know that it all came from this one you know, stream of random numbers. So we would want to be able to send just one little piece of information that's like, how do you reconstruct that stream of random numbers uh, so that you don't have to send that whole thing across, right? Uh, and that is typically what's called the seed, right? It's called the, the seed because you start the random number generation with it. Uh, and basically what it is when we get up to uh, real random number generation, that's the number that you start out with uh, to start running through the permutations that the random number generator does to produce a series of random numbers. And of course, it's always pseudo-random, really, because they're not random if they're reproducible like that. Uh, and so you could think about that in terms of our random number table pretty easily, actually, because really, for in our case, what the seed is is just what number in the table you started on. So for example, if we wanted to uh, pick a random series here, we would just say, oh, start on number 35 or whatever, and just keep reading you know, sequentially right through there. That would be our seed, uh, because that's the only real control we have over where we get in the sequence. Now we could have a little more information. We could say, for example, what index we're gonna start on and how many numbers to skip each time or something like that, right? So go by twos or go by fours, right? Something like that. Uh, so you can imagine different ways that we could construct our own notion of a seed uh, for our random number table. But for the time being, we don't really have to care too much about that because we're not doing those sorts of things. But I wanted to bring it up so you'd understand the concept of it because it is something that will come into play later when we want to do fancier things with the random number generator. And what that motivates for our design is that uh, I want to have a way... Um, because looking at, you know, this is just my experience as a programmer speaking. We haven't seen this uh, become necessary in the code right now. It's just my experience saying, hey, look, we want to do this, trust us, it'll save, save us time later. My experience says that generally what you want to do with random numbers is you never want people to just grab random numbers. You want them to basically have some handle uh, that they use to get random numbers so that that handle can track a particular stream so that you can have multiple streams of coherent random numbers in your program, some of which might be actually things that are supposed to appear random on that playthrough, like particle effects and whatever, and others might need to be controlled randomness uh, that, that's you know, producing a repeatable series on multiple people's machines at the same time, so that you can do things like send those seeds across and that sort of thing. 
Uh, and that's something that you probably would have seen in like, uh, I think even the new Binding of Isaac Rebirth, I, I don't actually know for sure, but I think in the new Binding of Isaac Rebirth, they do things where you can basically like enter a seed or something to start playing, right? I think, that, so I, I think this kind of thing has been sort of exposed to users in the past. It's not, you know, it's, it's not an unusual thing, right, to, to think about. So what that means is uh, I want to transform uh, this code to start thinking in terms of some kind of a handle, right? Uh, that's like a random series, you know, it's, it's some <coughs> series of randomness. And for our purposes, all it's really going to be, you can see it here, we've got this random number index, all it's going to be is that index, right? It's just going to be that index uh, that we need to pull stuff out. But later it might, you know, not mean that so much, right? So when we draw a test ground, what we'll do uh, is we'll just initialize our random series. Uh, so we'll do series equals and we'll just say like, oh, we'll seed it with zero because that's what we seeded it with before. Um, or we could seed it with whatever, we have one, two, three, four, it doesn't really matter. And we'll just assume that this seed call produces a random series, starting with whatever the seed that was input, somehow it generates a random series out of that. And any, any time that anyone, anywhere in the world, for any reason, running handmade hero, creates a random series with that seed, we expect the series to be the same. And in this case, if it's just gonna become that random number index, that's what uh, it will do, and so that's fine, right? So then once we have that, uh, we don't have to do this anymore because we'll assume that that'll get taken care of inside the thing. Uh, and then I just wanna pull out the things that we were doing. Uh, so here's one of them, right? Uh, we've got random number table, uh, and then we did a mod by two, right? So we're getting one and we're, and we're, we're doing some kind of a mod. And what I'd, like to, what I'd like to call that basically is random choice. You know, we're making a random choice here, right? Between things. So I wanna pass that random series uh, and then I want to say, I want to make a random choice where you pick one out of two options. So I'm just going to pass the two options, you know, zero, one, whatever, right? Uh, and then when I come down here, I see this other way that we were using it, right? Um, we had this, this one in here where we were basically doing a, a, a random, I'm going to call this random unilateral, right? Uh, and so I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. So by the way, this is going to be, uh, I guess this is going to be... A, uh, a random choice, so we'll call this random choice, uh, and that's going to take the random series, and then it's going to take the choice count, like so. Um, and I guess this could really be unsigned because we're not going to support negative uh, numbers in there. Uh, and that's what we were doing here, so that way when I implement this, we'll know. And then similarly, we had one here that was going to basically return one floating point number, right? Uh, and it's re returning a floating floating point number uh, between zero and one. Right, that's what this was doing. So it doesn't really take any inputs, it just returns uh, between zero and one. And that's a useful thing uh, to have it do as well. Now, the interesting thing about this, the reason I said random unilateral, is because I like to separate my random numbers, and again, this is just experience talking here and the way I like to do things, um, is I like to have random unilateral and random bilateral. And what those are is zero to one, unilateral, negative one to one, bilateral, right? Um, and uh, I don't really know. Uh, I don't really know where I picked up that terminology. Uh, in fact, I guess you could also call it random normal, and random binormal might be another way to do it. So you know, a normalized number is zero to one, and a binormal number negative one to one. Um, That's pretty good too. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and stick with that because uh, I think that's the way I, I've typically prepared to do it. I don't know, let's well let's look it up. Let's look it up. Let's see what's a good term. I mean it's never uh, it's never uh, too late. But you can see having or relating to two sides or affecting both sides, right? It's kind of uh, that nice sort of uh, feel for negative one to one, right? Uh, and, and unilateral, right? Uh, only one side, right? Um, so I don't know, I'm gonna leave it that way because that's the way I typically name them. So let's just do that. But you, know, you could imagine other names and you can pick which, when you're doing your version of this code, you should pick whatever makes the most sense to you, right? Certainly. Uh, so that's random unilateral. But you know, the other thing that we might wanna look at, right? Is this format seems kind of useful too, right? We sort of have this thing where we're doing, you know, we wanted to produce something. Uh, in fact, we did this whole math uh, 
this whole we, we had this whole mass situation about it we, we, that, we, that we did right uh, we came in and uh, and we said uh, this this whole thing here where we were talking about <clears throat> you know we need to solve to produce a number between negative one and one or whatever else what would be nice is if we could just do that from now on without having to worry about doing the math we could just ask for the random number that we wanted right so we could just say random you know between uh, so something like random real between or something like that or just random between and say like minimum and maximum right because then we could just do something where we say you know what do you actually uh, want this thing uh, to be right now of course in this case it happens it just so happens that the equation that we wanted was between negative one uh, and one so we could just call uh, random bilateral here right because that happens to be uh, exactly the range that we wanted uh, but you can imagine us wanting something a little more fl flexible than that and so you know let's just throw it in there as well uh, just so we can kind of have that that nicely rounded out right uh, so basically that's just two random bilaterals uh, like so so that's all good but you could imagine taking this even a little bit further uh, what if I wanted to to have a way to make those two you know we could we could do random bilateral uh, bilateral oops bilateral two right or something like that uh, and and that actually produces this kind of vector for me now we haven't seen much of that yet and I expect we'll see more of it in the world thing so it's a little premature to go down that route so I'm not going to um, but you can kind of see where that's headed right so let's take a look at this right here uh, this this is another case of that random choice thing we're choosing uh, bitmaps out of this so this would just be saying okay whatever that array count is we want to we want to pick one of those right that's how we're doing that uh, random choice actually because I don't need the parentheses anymore random choice uh, and similarly this one as well random oops random choice uh, at series array count so now we've got you know that kind of nicely cleaned up and uh, yeah that looks pretty good to me that looks pretty good uh, so let's go ahead and implement that Let's make sure this compiles okay. Uh, oh, right, we didn't actually make our seed function yet. Uh, so here is our seed function. There we go. Random series. Uh, and this is our seed. And our seed takes some kind of an unsigned integer there uh, and returns uh, the result. Oops. So in order to do our seed function, right, this is going to be really simple. The seed function is probably the easiest thing. Uh, all we really need to do for that for that is assign the random number index uh, to be whatever the the seed value that comes in like so but we also need to make sure that it's sort of you know that it's going to be kind of clamped in here right so it's going to be uh, it's it's we, we don't want to be out indexing outside the range of the table right uh, so we want to do uh, something where we're going to make sure that we mod by whatever the array count uh, is of that of that random number table right so that way it's always inside the table uh, so yeah I mean implementing the rest of this is just pretty rote it's basically what we've already done uh, so I'm gonna write all these in terms of essentially you can you can see this operation happened in each one of them this random number table you know you increment the thing and go so what I'm gonna do is just say all right uh, let's assume that there's a thing which is like next random uint 32 kind of a thing uh, where you pass the random series and that's responsible for getting that next random number uh, so it just returns you that random number table uh, with the random number index and I can just make that index now right we don't really need to uh, be verbatim because it's inside the series uh, so that series index we're just gonna go ahead and grab whatever one is out of there uh, and that's gonna be the result and then we're just gonna quickly test to see if we have outstayed our welcome right so the series index if the series index is now greater than or equal to that size of the table, random number table, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it back around to zero, right? And then we'll return whatever it was, the result that popped back out. So once we have that, really all we need to do is produce, uh, you know, use that to, to produce all the, other, all the other things that we actually needed, right? Uh, so in this case, we've got, uh, you know, we're, we're going to, ask for the next random number that comes back and then we're going to mod it by whatever that choice count is right like so um, and that's really the entirety of the function 
Uh, similarly, same thing here. Like all I'm really doing is just, uh, is, you know, literally doing the rote transformation uh, of saying, you know, next random uint32 replaces wherever we were going to look up in the table. Uh, and that's how we produce the result now, right? So there's that result. Um, we could also make this be something that's, that's pre-computed, right? Uh, we could say something like, um, you know, uh, divisor or something like this. Uh, and we could say, let's just allow the compiler a really clear way to pre-invert that number. And then we'll multiply by it instead. Uh, and that's just allowing it to, allowing the, the compiler to know that we're just doing a coefficient multiplication here. Now, is that really all that important? Not really in this context, but, you know, Usually CPUs are much better at multiplying than they are at dividing and phrasing things in terms of multiplication when you can is typically a good idea. So th since it's literally like trivial for me to modify the code to do that, you know, conveniently, uh, might as well, right? So yeah, let's go ahead in here and just, again, not particularly doing anything special here. Uh, I'm not even trying to, to make these at all optimal or even interesting. Uh, I'm going to say that if we want to do random bilateral, uh, we've got that code here the way we did it before, right? It's, it's this, uh, this sort of two uh, times <clears throat> whatever the unilateral result was, right? So here's random unilateral, uh, and then you subtract one. That was how we were doing it. Uh, really straightforward. And finally, if we did want to implement this random between, we did, you know, we worked out the math for that. Uh, you remember how we did it. We basically said, okay, uh, there was sort of a range, and that's the max minus the min, right? That's the total range of values. Uh, and then what we wanted to do is say, all right, to produce the result, uh, we take a random unilateral uh, from the series. Oops, got to add that series in there. Uh, we take a random unilateral from the series, and we need to multiply that, uh, you know, the range times that. So that gives us somewhere in the range. And then we just add that, that min offset to it, right? That's a, that's a pretty straightforward way to produce something in between those two. We know that if the random unilateral produces zero, uh, then we'll end up, and you know, I, I could phrase it this way to make it a little clearer. So you start at the minimum, and then you're just taking some amount of the range uh, and, and adding it in there. And again, this is, that, this is that function format that I talk about all the time, the blending function. It starts somewhere and you go a certain amount uh, towards, towards the other end. And we could phrase it in that way as well. In fact, you know what? Why don't I do that just to reinforce it here, uh, just just to make it clear what's going on? I think do we did we make one of these? Uh, did we make a linear blend function? We didn't. Oh man, how disappointing is that? I thought we probably would have already, uh, but it looks like we never did. Uh, that's too bad. That's too bad. Um, and I feel like we've been using it, right? I mean, we used in the sim region, um, I feel like we definitely, re uh, well, actually, you know what? I think we may have moved it out to, uh, uh, to the entities, right? The get stair ground. Yeah, so I mean, you can see that this, this form pops up everywhere, right? Um, it's the same thing, right? It's, you can, can see it happening. See how it happens here and here, right? When you have the range and the minimum, and then you multiply by whatever the amount from zero to one is that you want to go. Well, Psy, um, that's just the way that goes. But what I was basically saying is we could have done it this way, which is like a linear interpolate or something like that, which is often called lerp, right? Uh, you can say, I want to go from the min to the max by some value, which is going to be random unilateral series, right? Um, so that's, you know, sort of the, the thing that I assumed that we had already written. Doesn't look like we did. Uh, but again, that's just that, that blend format I've talked about um, on the stream multiple times. It's like, uh, you know, it's like an A and a B that you're going between. Uh, and it has that form of, uh, <clears throat> of one minus T times A uh, plus T times B, right? Uh, and at the risk of beating a dead horse because maybe people didn't watch the old streams or something like that, you know, this again is that sort of, it, it's so important that it's worth saying over and over and over and over again until we're blue in the face, just so everyone, so there's no chance uh, that you could ever possibly watch Handmade Hero and not know it. Um, it's 82, right? Yeah. Uh, just in case. 
Um, again, the way that that, the reason that I say those two are the same equation is because if you're going to blend uh, from A, you know, between two things, from A to B by some value that goes from zero to one, which is T, uh, right? That is that, that sort of universal blending equation, which is one minus TA uh, plus TB, right? And if you multiply that out, you get one minus TA, right? I'm just distributive property, right? Straight up high school math uh, at best, uh, TB, you know? Uh, and so if you think about what happens here in terms of, of grouping these terms, you can see that there's a T in both of these. So if we, there, if we go ahead and group that out, like this is the equation grouped by A, right? This, this term here being grouped by A, so it's one minus T A. If we instead grouped it by T, right? Uh, you end up with uh, plus T, you know, B minus A, right? That's just pulling out the T and you end up with a negative A and a positive B, so B minus A, right? That is the range. That's the difference between A and B, and this is the min, right? It's the place you're starting at. Now, they don't have to be mins and maxes. It doesn't matter what direction this goes. You don't really care. So min and max is irrelevant. It's really just A and B, uh, but in terms of the phrasing that we were using before, it's min and max, right? So you can see that these are the same uh, equation. They're just grouped a little bit differently. Uh, and yeah, like I said, you can never really repeat this too many times because if you don't know this equation by heart cold, uh, you are going to be a sad panda because it is basically the most useful thing you can possibly know. It, if you could only know one thing mathematically in game programming, it'd be this. Hopefully you know a lot more than one, but, but this would be it. Uh, so anyway. There it is, and I'm, since I bothered to write it, I'm going to stick it in here and use it because, you know, gosh darn it, um, you know, the world is, is running out of code and, and we need to conserve the code. It's a scalar operation after all. It should go in the scalar operations. There it is. No, it's there. There it is. See? I knew we had it. How come I couldn't find it? Is my search busted? What did I do? I, I, I fat fingered it, didn't I? Lame. All right, so there it is, and you can see that I've already written it there, so that's good, so we can do it. All right, okay, I feel better. I was like so ready for it to be there, I was like hoping it was there, and then I was like, ah, it wasn't there, and it was this big letdown. Uh, so okay, so it was just the search, fat fingered, and so, you know, disaster narrowly averted. Disaster narrowly averted, good, good. Uh, but yes, again, if anyone who, who hasn't gotten that totally down, we'll still say it a few more times probably on the stream, but that's, that's the function that you gotta know. Uh, so there we go. That's that's a lerp uh, going on there, and that's all good. So uh, let's finish the the uh, the fixer, the, the replacement here. So we need to change this to a random choice as well, uh, and uh, just grab out that uh, bit there. These are land random bilaterals, so we can do. Uh, oops, that's an address of series. There we go. Uh, another random bilateral, and let's see if that worked out for us. It did. That's what we expect to see, so that's all good. Um, and you know what we could do to, uh, you know, I don't know if we actually really want to, but, you know, we could make it so just to, to demonstrate what happens there, we could make it so that uh, this seed kind of permutes itself periodically. Um, I don't know that we really care about that, but that's something that we could do so we could see how it changes what the background is, but we'll leave that for some of the time. So anyway, uh, what we can do is we can continue this down now to anywhere we were using the random number table, right? And so we can make another random series here uh, that's something else, uh, you know, four or five, six, seven or whatever. I don't know. It doesn't have to be something else. It could be the same series. Who cares? Uh, we'll deal with that a little bit later. But point being, uh, what we can do now is make sure everything works off of this because why not? Uh, we, we spent the time to do it. We might as well clean up all the code. Uh, and so what we can do is just say, all right, get rid of that. Um, it looks like we actually have a random choice variable here. So perhaps I shouldn't have called the function random choice, but uh, yeah, you know, what do you, it's, it's, you know, it's an oversight. Uh, let's go ahead and say that random choice uh, is going to be, what is this actually a choice of? Uh, this is actually like a door direction, right? Uh, think is what we actually did. 
Uh, so let's let's call that door direction because that's actually what it is. It's not just a random choice. It's the random choice of door direction. Uh, so it looks like we want to do random choice series uh, of two here, and we want to do random choice uh, series of three here, like so. Uh, otherwise known as if that's true, then we do a two, otherwise we do a three, right? Is that basically all that was doing? Um, seems like that was true. So let's go ahead and make that be true. That was easy. Uh, and then we come down here and it looks like there's really not much else in terms of randomness. Looks like just the familiar offset, uh, where the familiars were going in our random familiar generator here. Uh, but we can do that one as well, right? Uh, we can just say that uh, we want, I guess it looks like it's just an X, Y there. Uh, and it's an X, Y between, between negative seven and three. Right? I mean, that's what we wrote here because we're producing a number between 0 and 9 and then we're subtracting 7 from it. Uh, so no, so it's, it's, it's between negative 7 and 2. Yeah, so that's kind of hard to read and, and we don't even know what's going on there. So I think this might be another good reason to augment this with, you know, one of these random betweens that works for integers too, you know. Um, if we did something like this, uh, where we can say, give me a minute and a max in integer space and, and get one out there. Uh, that, that seems like a pretty good idea to me. Uh, I don't know about you guys. So yeah, I would say in this case, we could use that form. We can't use the lerp because that's floating point. Um, and you wouldn't want to produce those intermediate values. You need actual integer uh, values. Uh, but you know, we can still do the exact same thing, right? It's just the min plus uh, the max minus the min. Um, as the range. So all we really need to do is just say next random unit 32 mod that range, right? Uh, like so. Uh, and so that way that'll give us, you know, it'll start at the minimum and then we'll make, uh, we'll get a random number and we'll produce some offset, basically doing the exact same thing we're doing here, uh, only at least now it'll be a little more readable. So we can say, you know, random between uh, past that series and then say, all right, we want a random number between negative seven and two. And now at least we can see that that's what's, what it's doing, right? Uh, and similarly here, I want uh, you know, that random number uh, between uh, negative three, right? Uh, and plus nine, so it's gonna be six, I guess. Again, I don't really know what we were doing there, but I guess we were just trying to figure out reasonable places where the familiars could be. Um, but uh, yeah, but I don't know. So we'll just do that and make sure it works okay. Uh, that doesn't look quite right. Our familiar is gone. Where did our familiar go? Uh, random between series, pass them in, get the max min, we mod by that, we add. Of course, this is coming out as a uint32, which is, you know, is not the best possible thing. So I wonder if we want to make sure we can sort of do that. Uh, to make sure that we've got the the positive negative range there, but yeah, what what did I I must have I must something up. Let's go in and, and uh, set a breakpoint there. There we go. Uh, wait, so no, no, it's it's offset from the camera tile, so that's fine. All right, so let's double check here. Random between. Um, let's see, min and max. We actually want to see those in regular numbers. Uh, so max minus min is nine, which is what we expect. Uh, so what's our result there? Uh, it's negative seven. That seems like a totally plausible value to me. Um, what happens here? Result is five, which is also a totally plausible value. Um, yeah. So where did our familiar go? Our familiar is up there. So I must have really misread what we were doing, um, which again is why I said I wanted to replace those routines. I guess I was not concentrating well enough on that. 
so I, I, yeah, I thought that it was saying minus seven. So it should start at negative seven and then it should go between zero and 10, right? I don't see what the, yeah, I don't know. Um, I feel like that, uh, yeah, but I must have, I must have misread that there. I guess what I can do is just take a look uh, at what it actually was. Let's take a look. So what did I misinterpret here? We're modding by 10. So whatever comes out of the random number table is going to be between 0 and 9, right? Uh, well, you know what? We don't even have to guess. I guess we'll just go ahead and, and, and see what that is. Next random uint32. You know what it could be? It could be that it was just happening to produce a number that happened to be pretty far forward and we just haven't ever rerun it again because you know it wasn't it was always going to produce the same random uh, series since we were going through the table in the same same order that could actually be the be the whole thing could be that i translated it entirely properly uh which does seem potentially to be the case but let's take a look let me just verify um that that's the case we are offset one six uh, so let's see what we get there Oh, okay. So yeah, we're totally fine. So I think what actually was happening there was we just happened to have a fortuitous random number, and one time in one, you know, when we were kind of going through things, it turned out that it was, you know, some sort of a situation that that fortuity, fortuitously still placed it uh, in the right spot on the screen. I feel like that's probably true, uh, but you know, I could be wrong about that. So yeah, let's think about this for one second though. If the monstar is at negative three plus two, yeah, so if I go back, if I go back in here um, and just sort of put this back in, if I actually wanted to do what's probably the right thing for the familiar randomness wise, we probably want his y offset. Uh, if the monstar is at camera tile plus two, uh, we probably want the familiar to be at like something that's gonna be negative off the camera tile and then it's probably fine however you know far he is in either direction negative seven to seven uh, or something like that uh, I don't know let's take a look let's see what that gives us so that's fine and let's maybe let's generate just a few more of those just to see um, yeah uh, so that looks a little bit better in terms of, of what's going on with the with the familiars there uh, similarly, maybe give them a little more range in, in terms of the locations there. Uh, so that looks pretty good. Yeah. Um, and I do, I feel like maybe, maybe we've got to do, you know, I realize the phrasing of this routine is a little bit off. Uh, so like, just hear me out for a second on this. So basically, you know, we've got this situation where we're saying min and max, and in this case, uh, we're including the max in the range. And in this case, we're not including the max in the range. Uh, I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory, right? If this came out to be zero, we would, uh, it would be kind of invalid, right? But if it comes out to be one, then we're only ever gonna produce a zero here, which means we always produce the min. Whereas what we want to do if there's a range of one is produce either the min or the max, right? And, and so on and so forth. So I feel like really what we would want to do to match this routine is, is include that extra, you know, the max. In fact, you could say it's, it's the max plus one minus the min, right? Because we're, we're, we're wanting to be one over from that. Uh, hopefully that makes some sense. And that's why we were seeing that familiar with only on one line before, where it really should be on uh, three lines, right? And so now it is on three lines and that's better. So that's good. Um, I think that's a good thing. So yeah, now we got that randomness in there. That's pretty good. Uh, I think that's a nice thing. Uh, so I'm not sure what to tackle exactly next. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes to go. Uh, so we probably should do something else relatively substantial, not too big, but uh, we've taken care uh, of everything regarding the random number table here. We could, I suppose, also do something where we like, uh, you know, move this, move this down. Let's, let's make sure that nobody's ask, asking for that outside here. Yeah, they're not. 
So I think we're, we're pretty much good. We've removed any dependency directly on that table from the code. And so that way when we vaporize it, we just redo these routines. And in fact, basically we set ourselves up so we only have to redo one routine, which is next random uint32. That's the only thing uh, that we'll really have to redo. Well, and seed, I suppose, when we switch to uh, an actual random number generator instead of a table. So I think that's in good shape. Um, yeah, so what next is the question. Uh, and I don't really know which one we should do next. I suppose what we could do is we could try doing, uh, let's try doing a pre-composite. You know, why not? I mean, it's a smaller, it's a smallish thing to do. We could probably do that uh, right here. So what I'm thinking, right, is, you know, I want to start, I want to take this, this uh, draw um, test ground thing and I just kind of want to make this into something that can do a composite uh, of the ground without having to redo it every frame, right? So what I want to do is say, oh, I want to, you know, uh, build test ground or something like that, right? Uh, and make that, make that happen. And I guess, you know, technically I could still call that draw test ground. It's not really a big deal. But basically what I'm going to do is take this game off screen buffer thing. I want to make that... Um, so that I can just sort of pass something that's not actually the real game off screen buffer, right? So here's what that was, you know, uh, and what I could do is just say, all right, well, loaded bitmap, right? Uh, I don't know if you remember, where is loaded bitmap? Loaded bitmap uh, looks exactly like that. So if, if, I, if you take a look at uh, handmade platform and I've got game off screen buffer, right? and then I've got loaded bitmap, they're really, really similar. You know what I'm saying? So I'm wondering is, what if we just condense those two things down to one thing? Uh, you see what I'm saying there? Hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, so that really we don't have two different things, we just have one, uh, and we go from there. So let's say we have a loaded bitmap and we were to introduce the pitch to that, right? Uh, and, uh, and, you know, maybe loaded bitmap isn't the greatest term. Maybe just bitmap would be a better term for it, right? Uh, or, or something like that, but either way. Uh, so let's say I introduce pitch to that. How hard would that be uh, for us to support? Because we only have one function really that uses it. And so if we take a look through here, uh, we can kind of see that, that really uh, we don't have to care to, we don't, we don't really do much uh, that has to deal with, with that pitch. All we were really doing before was sort of banking on the fact that we could just use the width. But if we were to update things to work with the pitch, you can, you can see us doing it right here um, with the, with the uh, game buffer. So we should be able to do the exact same thing uh, with our source buffer, right? So let's just go ahead and make that modification, right? Let's say uh, that we go ahead and pull stuff out of the source the same way we do for the pitch, right? Um, and it looks like what we're doing here is we're actually pre-inverting that. And uh, because remember our bitmaps were like bottom up instead of uh, top down, uh, you know, we, we were kind of doing a, a flip in there. But that's kind of interesting because that means we could just bake that right into the pitch, right? So from now on, we could just say it's whatever the bitmap pitch is. That's what we're going to use uh, as the offset. And then that way we set it to flipped or we don't set it to flip. It doesn't matter which one it is. So whichever way we loaded it in, we could still... It, the, the blit would now work, um, would, would do the right thing by reading that, that pitch out, right? Uh, and so, you know, if I, if I basically turn this equation, you know, this destro thing, if I basically do the destro thing uh, exactly the same way for the source row, and uh, it's weird that we have two of these here. It, weird that we do a plus equals a minus. I mean, this is what we're doing, right? Um, so let's do that, that, uh, that whole thing together. Uh, and in fact, I guess we, our source row is, is actually supposed to be uint dates here, right? Because we're just like dest row. So if we do our source row that way, we say, all right, we've got the bitmap pixels. We want to add uh, the pitch, uh, you know, with the, the height minus one. And I guess we don't really need to do that part either because we could bake that uh, into the pixels pointer as well. Um, so that may be what we want to do there too. Uh, so maybe we, maybe we get rid of that as well, right? Let me just put that up there for now, temporarily. Uh, so really all we need to do is this, right? We just need to say, all right, um, we need to move 
by our source offset y, we need to move by that uh, in the pitch, pitch space, right? And we need to move by that source offset x. So this is just pre-stepping us to where we need to grab out of this bitmap, right? Uh, and uh, I guess bytes per pixel, interestingly, is, is not specified in our bitmap. We kind of know that it's always four. Uh, so I don't know that I really want to introduce that into this specifically. So I might just say that there's a bytes per pixel equals four on here uh, for now, because we're not really gonna allow multiple bytes per pixel in our bitmaps. They always have to be four. Uh, so I'm just gonna say it's gotta be four. Uh, so basically it's, it's, it's that. So you can see this is the exact same pre-stepping basically that we're doing, uh, nothing particularly fancy there. All right, so if I were to do that, right, and now I compile it, uh, we compile, but of course we totally wouldn't work because our loading, our loaded bitmap call doesn't actually set any of that up at all, right? So what we wanna do here is at the end, uh, we wanna set this stuff up. So we've got a pitch, we need to set it, uh, and then we need to set the pixels pointer properly, right? Uh, and the pixels pointer I'm gonna to set to avoid now is to make sure that we don't uh, do any uh, funny business there with it, right? Uh, so, all right, so the pitch is always just gonna be uh, the width multiplied by the bytes per pixel. Um, and, you know, we could actually put the bytes per pixel in here, but I, I really just don't want to do that. Uh, so I guess what we, have, what we might want to do is just have a global define for that, uh, like something like loaded bitmap bytes per pixel, something like that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and so that we just kind of go ahead and grab that anytime we need it, because I just don't think that that's a useful thing to parameterize in the bitmap. I'd rather have the compiler be able to see that it's just a constant value that doesn't have to worry about. Um, I feel like we did source row needs to be changed based on clipping. I feel like that's a stale to do. Anyway, uh, so yeah, so we go ahead and do that. Let's um, go down here. So the pitch uh, is right there. There it is. Uh, and what is, oh, result is, is not a pointer. So there's, there's that. Uh, so yeah, so it's just the width times however many bytes per pixel they are, that's the pitch. But like I said, we want to go backwards, so we're gonna make that negative. And then we want our pixels pointer to actually be synthetically set uh, to that top row, just like we were doing before. So that's again, just this, uh, where we have that pitch. Um, we wanna take what our old pixel pointer was that we were using before, and we wanna back that up uh, so that it's basically at the, that, that first row. So I think that's the stuff that we would need to do for that. Let's take a look. Um, of course, we will crash immediately because I typed something wrong. Uh, hold on a second. Let's, uh, let's take a look. Um, so let's see, we got the pitch correct. It's, it's negative uh, 1024 there. Uh, we are properly, this is not, okay, so we've got, First of all, hold on a second. We've got one more thing we need to adjust there is now that we've changed our pointer size, right? Uh, we would like to be able to, we need to be able to step uh, our stuff. Oh wait, no, and that's not, that's, that's not true. These are casted to uint32s. So these are still stepping a full pixel at a time. Uh, so that's totally fine. Uh, that's not a problem at all. So that's, that's all good. Nothing weird going on there. And um, yeah, yeah, okay. All right, so that's fine. So let's go ahead and step through and see what the, uh, whatever it was that I introduced that was uh, incorrect. So, <clears throat> oh yeah, it's this right here. So the pitch being negative moves us back a row, but we, we needed to move forward rows because this is actually going the other direction, right? So that's actually stepping us back uh, based on the direction that the pitch is going now. Uh, so that was dumb. All right, so that was our only problem. So we're in good, we're in good shape now. Uh, and so now, really, like you can see, what I've done here is just made it so that it doesn't actually matter uh, for draw bitmap what's actually getting passed to it. Could be an off-screen buffer, or it could be another bitmap. So I could do loaded bitmap buffer now, right? And then, uh, oops. And then in here, uh, when we do memory. Uh, what I can do is just change this to memory and now uh, everything 
uh, lines up properly, they're exactly the same. Uh, so let's, uh, let's do pixels to memory. Anybody else? Uh, what is that complaining about? Bytes per pixel. Ah, yeah, so this is just going to be this again. And I don't remember why we even had that in here. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and say, you know, can we just remove this entirely? Because uh, it says right here, pixels are always 32 bits wide. Uh, so I'm just going to maybe just say that that has to go away, right? Um, and uh, and we, could, we could put this in here as well, right? Something like this. Because we really don't ever allow that to vary. Uh, and so we should just, we should just say that goes away. Uh, so that's, that's that. Um, here we, let's put that in here. Bitmap bytes per pixel. Bitmap bytes per pixel, something like that. Pixels, uh, it's just memory now, right? Bitmap bytes per pixel, and I'll throw that in there. Bitmap bytes per pixel, keep on going. Pixels minus result pitch. Pixels is not a member, that's true. It's memory now. Uh, and should be almost done. Draw bitmap, right. So now uh, when we call draw bitmap, right, what we can do is we can just say, okay, everything now takes um, sort of one of these loaded bitmap things. And when we pass it buffer, uh, instead of that buffer that we were getting before, right, uh, where we're, we're calling it here, what I'm gonna do is say that, that, uh, that buffer is actually going to be, I'll name it something else, uh, let's say uh, draw buffer or something like that, draw uh, buffer, like so, draw buffer, draw buffer, draw buffer, draw buffer, draw buffer, like that. Um, and uh, <clears throat> then I'm gonna say loaded bitmap, uh, draw buffer, and I want to make it a pointer so I don't have to make all these be ands. Uh, so I'm just going to make a little synthetic one here to point to, like so, uh, like that. Again, this is just, I don't feel like making these be ands, you know, have to have ands in front of them all the time. So I want it to be a pointer. Uh, but what I can do here is now just initialize this uh, to be whatever the stuff was that we were getting sent from the OS, right? Pitch memory. Um, they're all just exactly the same. And we could even collapse these even further now uh, if we really wanted to. Um, oops. So uh, draw rectangle, same thing. That can just be a loaded bitmap now. And you know, the name loaded bitmap doesn't really make a lot of sense. That might be something we want to change in the future. Uh, bytes per pixel is now uh, not a thing. And so off we go. Here's our game still rendering properly. And so now if we do want to cache something, um, we've set ourselves up to do that. So for example, I mean, you can see how slow this is running right now, right? Like look at that frame rate just chugging along and all of that's in that stamping, really. Uh, so now if we wanted to cache that, when we drew draw uh, test ground, right? When we actually do that, uh, that draw test ground function, if instead we just did that at init time, right? We could do that at init time now if we wanted to. Uh, so when we do this, we could say draw test ground and we can draw that into some kind of a buffer. Uh, just to give you an example there, let's say we do game state uh, ground buffer like this. We're kind of running out of time here. Maybe we'll go uh, just a few minutes over. I think we have two or three minutes on the, on the clock spare. I didn't start right on time. Uh, but if I come in here to, to, uh, to game state, and I say, all right, we've got a loaded bitmap. That's just the ground buffer. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and so let's go ahead and do that. Then all I would need to do is my, this ground buffer thing uh, would just have to be like make you know, empty buffer or something like this, or make empty bitmap. And I just want to make an empty bitmap that's some size of something. Who cares? It's 1024 by 1024. I don't even care at all. And we just need a place to get that from. Uh, and so that can come out of, uh, we haven't really talked still about, we, we still have kind of a, a, a big old standing to do for world arenas here. So, you know, it's, it's, it'd be nice if we at some point actually uh, started to, to get these arenas into, into more shape, something we have to do pretty soon. But anyway, 
Uh, if I wanted to, I can go ahead and, uh, and still use that, that game arena for this um, and say, <clears throat> uh, let's see here. Say, go ahead and, and use this arena, uh, get me one of those and, and, and give it back. And then we can draw it into that ground buffer. And then when we come down here, I'll just re-enable uh, this call uh, so that we're basically on top of it. We're gonna draw that, uh, that ground buffer um, and we'll draw it at, at, I guess, zero, zero for now. Now, I mean, we don't really know, I guess we would draw it at something, you know, an offset that was uh, proportional to the difference between heights. So I could even do this to do, in case you draw this at center, um, but that's basically all we would need to do, uh, right? So here we go, let's do that. Let's make this make empty bitmap. That's gonna return a loaded bitmap um, struct that has the information about the bitmap that was created. Uh, we've got our arena here that we want it to allocate from. We've got the width and the height. So there's the, uh, the width and the height uh, of that buffer. 1024 by 1024 may have been a little bit large. Uh, that may have been a mistake. Uh, so maybe we want that to be like 512 by 512 for now. So we'll just take a look at that. Uh, and we'll go back to make empty bitmap there. Make empty bitmap and implement it. Now the question is, can I implement it in two minutes, which I think is our three minutes, which we had left. It seems plausible, you never know. Uh, so here's that result. Uh, the result has a width of width, it has a height of height, it has um, a pitch of whatever uh, the pitch is times the bitmap bytes per pixel, right? Uh, and then it has uh, memory that is going to be, um, <clears throat> oh, and you know what I just realized? We can even use this call, uh, now that I think about it, to clear it. <laughs> so we don't have to clear it ourselves, which is pretty funny. Uh, I don't know if we really need that. We could just, do we have a zero size call? We do. So we really only need that zero size call, so never mind. Uh, so we do have a zero size call, so we just want to zero that memory out. Uh, so we'll just say, uh, total bitmap size, and this will be an arena push uh, where we're basically saying uh, we want to push. Well, you know what? This is just a direct push size, like so. That's all that is. So we're going to say take the arena that we were passed, uh, do the total bitmap size, and of course we know what the total bitmap size is. Uh, the total bitmap size is just the width um, times the height times the bitmap bytes per pixel, right? And we could use the pitch for that if we wanted to, but you know, if we set the pitch to negative or something, then that wouldn't work. So that makes an empty bitmap that we can draw into. It's basically doing the same thing that we did way back at the beginning of the series. Uh, oops, what did I do wrong? That should return, that was right, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah I don't know what's going on there. Uh, all right, so let's see. Uh, okay, so we ran out of space. Uh, in our memory arena. Oh, why is that so huge though? Did I compute that wrong? Width times height. Whoa, what? What did I type in? Ah, ah, that's, uh, that's too large. Uh, that's too large. Um, all right, so not quite there yet. I don't see our bitmap, which is not a good sign. Uh, it was supposed to work. It didn't work. Let's take a quick look and see uh, if we can find it. So we're drawing our, our bitmap now into that uh, into that buffer, uh, and uh, and we are hoping that it works properly. Ground buffer, uh, yeah, like so. And then we are we are actually drawing it. Yes, uh, in here uh, at zero zero. Uh, and I don't know, I don't know if I will have to delay debugging this because uh, who knows, I don't know how complicated the bug might be. Uh, I don't want to go too far over time. I'd like to make sure we have time for questions. Um, but yeah, I feel like that should have been uh, sufficient uh, unless I'm missing something. We are definitely drawing into uh, we are not like woefully drawing out, drawing outside the boundaries of this guy, and we know that um, because 
oh, well, you know what it could be? It could be that, that we're, we don't have a big enough bitmap to cover where the ground actually was or something like that. But I don't think that's true because it uses the center, uh, does it not, of the actual, yeah. It uses the center of the actual, um, of the actual screen there, I thought. Uh, meters to pixels times minus bitmap center. Uh, and where is bitmap center? Bitmap center is defined here. In fact, we could pull that out uh, to there, bitmap center, like so on. Oh, wait, no, that's the, never mind. That's not the buffer center. That's, this is the screen center. So there's that screen center that it's using. So that seems like that should put everything at the center of the bitmap nicely. Um, so I'm not sure why we weren't getting anything there. Uh, it would be nice to see uh, why that is, oh, I know why. It's right here, people. We're never setting the alpha channel, right? We're never setting the alpha channel. We've got to set the alpha channel of our of our composited bitmap. Otherwise, it'll just think that it, you know that it's basically marked as not not being there, right? Uh, so there it is. And now you can kind of see like uh, you can kind of see that that we got the acceleration kind of that we were expecting there. It looks like that we've we've still got uh, some kind of bug there. You can see down in the corner, like that should not be a notch, I would think. Uh, so we kind of have, we've got, we've got something. Although, you know what that probably is? That's just because nothing ever touched there. So that's still alpha zero. Uh, so what we probably want to do here though, still is just go ahead and, and fix the fact that we, you know, instead of always having that alpha, uh, what we might want to do is is write the alpha actually into the buffer. Of course, uh, the problem with that is we actually need to think about what the A value actually should be, right? Like what is the alpha that you actually would write in there? Um, and, uh, and that's probably a topic better left uh, for a different day. Uh, so let's, let's, let's do that tomorrow to do Casey uh, compute the right alpha here. Still have to have our talk about pre-multiplied alpha, uh, but when we do compute the right alpha here, that'll go there, uh, and then we can go ahead and actually uh, do this for reals, where we do something like that and write an alpha channel out. So for now, what I'll do is I'll just say, okay, we'll just take the alpha of whatever the thing is that we're writing, you know, just the actual alpha channel itself, uh, but that's not uh, correct, and so maybe tomorrow uh, we will do that. Uh, so this should be SA, right? Uh, not A, SA. So that should be SA everywhere. Like that. All right. Uh, so I think that's about it. Um, oops, that didn't work. What did I do wrong there? Um, what did I do wrong there? We did SA, we grab SA. We take C alpha, we did all that. We grab the A equals SA. We do the blending based on SA, negative SA plus SA. Then we write in whatever the source alpha was. Um, a, U in 32, A plus 0.5. We cast it back down, we shift it up 24. That should have been fine, right? Let's, let's just double check. 1.0, oh, it's 255.0. Ah, duh. This is actually, yeah, so we uh, would actually would have to multiply it by 255 because we converted the alpha to be 0 to 1 because we wanted to do the blending, right? We wanted to do lerps all through here. So yeah, yeah, we deserved that. Um, so you can kind of see if I put the alpha in there, uh, then you can see if I just use whatever the source alpha is, um, I get whatever bitmap got stamped down last. Uh, is the one that uh, is the one that shows through. I mean, I could do something uh, a little cheesy, but I could do something where we just take whichever the maximum one is, right? We could say, oh, you know, the destination alpha, whatever was in that, you know, the the, the target buffer originally. Uh, we could do something where we basically say, like, you know, whatever the maximum value uh, is out of these two, that's the one that we'll take. Um, but again. We should, we should really go through it and do it more correctly. So you can kind of see it's starting to get a little more correct now, but still not quite right. Um, yeah, and there you go. So that's, you know, that's just the, the beginnings of how we might cache that. And now our frame rate is back up to normal, which is nice, even though we're doing all those things because we only did them once and now we're just reproducing them. 
And you can kind of see how I did that. I didn't really do anything, you know, ignoring this, which of course, like I said, we ran out of time. We could cover how we actually want to do that destination alpha. Uh, so ignoring that temporarily, and we'll maybe that's what we'll do tomorrow. Is we'll, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more completely. Uh, ignoring that for now, you can see how simple it was for me to do this. Basically, all I need to do is collapse those two things down so that the thing that we read from and the thing that we write to are handled symmetrically. Uh, and that's a pretty important thing to get right if, uh, you know, if you can. You want to be able to draw into stuff that you draw from because that's what allows you to cache, right? If I have all these things that are taking lots of bitmaps, collaging them together to produce the ground or whatever, and I want to be able to simply take that code that was working when it was drawing to the screen and make it so that it works when I'm drawing uh, to something that I will save and use later as a composite, you want all of those routines to be as symmetric as you can make them so that you can always sort of switch between which of those you're doing without having to make it this huge deal, right? Uh, and so that's something that, you know, is a good thing to know. So as we build our renderer in the future, that's something you really want to do. Uh, and obviously graphics cards support this now all the, uh, with render to texture is what this is, right? It's like allowing you to render into something that you then use to texture from. That's exactly what we just did, right? And you can see that it was very simple to do. All we had to do was make it so that we could use a loaded bitmap uh, struct to point to be a dest or a source. And because they really all need the exact same information. How big is it? What's the pitch? And where's the memory at? That's all they need. Uh, and, so, and so off you go. All right, so let's go ahead and go. Uh, it, it, let's let's go ahead and go to uh, the Q and A, right? I'm going to type in the old Q and A there. Uh, and uh, and let's uh, let's let's take questions. So please uh, keep your questions to stuff that we have been working on, and also uh, put Q colon in front of the questions so that I can see what's going on over there on the stream. Do, 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 do. Okay. Casey, I missed the earlier part of the feed, but what was the intention of moving the ground plane with the player? Mm. Can you be a little more specific about that? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure I, I'm not, sure uh, that I actually understand the question. Uh, can you be more specific about moving the ground plane with the player? Are you talking about, you, this is a graphics question or a collision question? Elaborate a little bit more on that Stegosaurus so I, and then I'll, um, and I'll tackle it. Why aren't random unilateral and random bilateral not just using the implementation of random between? Seems like a pretty clear violation of dry, although I realize you aren't currently intending for this code to be extremely clean right now. Uh, so I don't really, like, um, obviously I'm not someone who thinks that there's such a thing as dry or that it should be violated or not. But I can answer that specific question in the context um, of good or bad code. So. When you're talking about functions that are this straightforward, I don't think there's a very good reason to, to reorganize them that way, right? Because there's a very fine line between making code that uses itself, which is what you're suggesting, right? Trying to make the maximally uh, overlapping set of functions and basically setting things up to allow BLAS style optimization, right? Um, and by BLAS style uh, optimization, I mean basic linear algebra system, which was the kind of this old concept where you basically have core operations are broken out so that they can be optimized individually uh, when you go to do your performance optimization. And so usually what happens when I'm coding is when I'm down at the level where I know that like each of these things is going to be a specific operation uh, that's used, when they're this simple, I don't tend to collapse them. And the reason I don't tend to collapse them is because a, there's no reason to collapse them. Usually, like if I, you know, if I want to collapse them, if I thought that they were going to be doing exactly the same thing, I would collapse them perhaps. But if they're not doing exactly the same thing, like if 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 they're special purpose versions of each other that you can do, I'll often leave them broken out um, because I'll probably want to write specific code to do those later in a more efficient way, right? So in this example. Uh, you know, really even here, 
Uh, I probably would get rid of this lerp eventually. I wanted to use it because, like I was saying, uh, as I mentioned when I typed it in, I wanted to remind people that it was that function. So that's really the only reason that normally I wouldn't even have used it there. Uh, usually what will end up happening is I'll try to think through what the right way to write the code is knowing the things that I know. Because random between is much more general than random unilateral or random bilateral. So by forcing those to go through random between, there's less pos possibilities uh, for optimization there. And it makes it more confusing for the compiler as well, right? Uh, and so I tend not to, once I get down to a certain level, I don't tend to just have things call, it, call uh, utilities for their own sake, um, if that makes sense. Now, would I criticize someone for doing that? No, absolutely not. Uh, because the structure as it is exported to the rest of the program still works fine if you do that. So if you were to have random unilateral, random bilateral call random between, right? You could still have the, opt, uh, the opportunity to optimize them later because you know the rest of the code is still calling random unilateral or random bilateral as necessary. And just because you're revectoring through them, it doesn't matter, right? Um, but the reason I didn't bother to collapse them was because in my head, I'm just thinking, oh, these want to be broken out anyway, probably, right? That's like what I'm thinking. So I'm not going to bother trying to make sure that I have all of these things reusing each other because I don't think that's how they're going to work eventually, right? Does that make sense? So hopefully that is a little bit of, uh, gives you a little bit of that perspective on, on the way I was doing those things. Uh, so clock count someone wants a clock count but i've forgotten how to get the clock count i think we put it out here right clock.exe i like how something that counts the number of lines in a program is 11 megabytes large fantastic all right so we got clock uh, and we're going to go ahead and say all right uh, for clock let's go handmade.code is that how that works uh, so it's, it's not, we're not very large. We're 5,000 lines of code. That's not large, right? That's, that's pretty, I feel like that's pretty small. Um, yeah. Why does the seed function not have a prefix or suffix random? Uh, I don't know. I think really just because there's nothing else it could be. Um, but I don't. I don't have a problem with that. You know, if if you if you see this as a, you know, if you wanted to, I I'd be fine with that. You know, I'd be fine with saying that the way this works is is this way, if you wanted to, um, and everything was this prefix ran. If you know, if that was something that made you more comfortable, uh, regularize it's it's close enough to that um, that that seems fine. Uh, you know, so I'm, 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 I don't know that I would necessarily have ever bothered to regularize it in that way. Uh, cause I'm not sure that there's really any practical benefit to it, but if, if it helps you keep it more compartmentalized there, then, you know, um, and since this just takes a bare UN32, you know, maybe it's nice to have randoms to, you know, these guys are never going to get mistaken for anything else because even if someone else had something called random or had something called next UN32, they wouldn't take a random series pointer. So function overloading would prevent them from getting uh, from colliding. But random seed is definitely true that you know a UN32 is not special. Uh, so so you know I could see that, and so that's fine. You know that's uh, that's a totally fine thing to want uh, in the code. Is it okay that random choice doesn't select the random value uniformly? Depending on choice count argument value, it will prefer smaller values. For example, if random, if max random value is 10, then rnd mod eight will return zero to, ah. Uh, well, I would say no, it's not okay. Um, for now it's fine, but in the long run, no, it's not okay. Like. That's one of the reasons why having a tiny random table like this is not a good idea. But the random number generator that we actually use in practice, we will attempt to make uh, produce completely random bits. Uh, 
in terms of distribution. So that's really a, a thing to deal with more once we actually put the random number generator in, at which point, um, at which point like random choice should be actually uniform in its distribution, unless there's something else about it that, I, that I'm missing. But I feel like this should be, as long as the, uh, as, as the actual series itself is random, right? Um, so yeah, so I would say no, it's not really okay uh, but it's okay for now because we're not going to actually use that random table as the real thing that we use. Wouldn't random choice have a slightly uneven distribution if the number of choices didn't evenly divide the maximum random number? Hmm. I think you're probably right about that. In other words, once we go to something that generates 32 random bits, right, as opposed to this random number table, table, which does not do that. But once we move to something that actually generates 32 random bits, the question is, you know, what, what consequence does random choice have because it's using a mod? And I feel like you're probably right that there's a tiny, tiny bit of bias towards the lower numbers, like really, really tiny. Um, because you've basically got 4 billion unbiased regions and then this one little biased region at the very end. But I think you are correct. However, I am not good with number theory. And so I want to say that if you really want to know the answer to that question, um, you're going to have to ask someone with a better discrete math background than me because I'm only guessing at the answer I don't know. Certainly it won't produce any real problem in practice. I can pretty much guarantee you that. Uh, but if you really needed to care for some reason that there was literally no possible bias ever, um, you may you may have to do something else. You may have to do it a little differently. I don't know, right? Okay, keep going. When is it okay to pass larger objects like R3s by value instead of by reference? Um... So really the answer to that question, I'll, I'll, I'll say two different things. The first one is inline functions, you can pass pretty much whatever you want uh, most of the time. The optimizer and the compiler should be good enough to just expand those inline functions, look at them, figure out what they need to do and do the right thing, right? Probably. Now, as with everything else that has to do with compilers, you need to verify if you care, right? So in any circumstance where you really care, you gotta go verify. For other things, uh, what I would say basically is keep in mind that a pointer uh, in 64-bit code is eight bytes long. So any structure that's like in the neighborhood of eight bytes long, let's say that's eight bytes, 16 bytes, maybe even 32 bytes, you know, if you pass a pointer to it versus passing it, you're not saving much. And so, especially depending on, it, it's really mostly, all right, let's, let's back up. So when you call a function in, 64, in, X60, in X64 code, our current compile target, we call a function in X64 code, uh, basically what you're going to do is you're going, the compiler is going to push uh, the, the um, it's going to push the arguments on the stack if it can't fit them in the registers according to the ABI, the application binary interface, the thing that says how function calls work um, by convention, right? Because, you know, there's no such thing as a function call at the hardware level. There's just, an, uh, like, calling a function is just calling an address. There's no parameters, right? So it's just expected that the code on one side of the call uh, puts the parameters in some place where the code on the other side of the call knows where to get them. And so one place is on the stack, another place is in the registers of the CPU. 
And the registers on x64 CPU, they're 64 bits, obviously, so they're eight bytes long. Um, they may be significantly more than eight bytes long because there's uh, registers, there's XMM registers, there's AVX and all that stuff. And those get longer than eight bytes, right? Uh, those can be 128 bit, 256 bit. Uh, they can be very long. Uh, and so basically it's gonna stuff a bunch of stuff in registers for the call. And when it can't fit in registers, it will go ahead and put on the stack. And I don't remember what the ABI says. I should remember. I think the ABI says like you get half the registers for the push or something. I don't really remember. Um, but you know, it's, it's gonna be something that's like in the neighborhood of you know 64 bytes, something like that, right? So when you're passing stuff to a function, you can kind of think of it as like, you know, if you're passing stuff that's not gonna be that much larger than 64 bytes, 80 bytes, 90 bytes, I don't know. Most of that's probably going to registers anyway. You know, how much does it really matter at the end of the day? Um, so I don't know, it's tough to say. The other thing is, you know it's gonna be perfectly cached. You're gonna put it in into the uh, memory and put it right back out. So you're only really worried about if you're kind of overflowing cache. There's, there's a lot of stuff involved there. Um, so I would say, you know, it's, it's just not something that I think about too hard. You know, don't pass 4K objects on the stack, certainly. You don't, don't, don't pass things that are certainly large, but anything that's just in the neighborhood really shouldn't be that big of a deal. And, uh, you know, what you should probably be able to do is anywhere that you really cared about it, uh, just take a look at what the compiler is doing and make sure that it's okay. Uh, and time it, you know, if, if, it's, if it's in there, just time. Uh, the calls in either way and see what happens. That's really the only way to know for sure. Uh, but you know, hopefully that gave you a little bit of perspective on kind of roughly what's going on in the process. And to be honest with you, on x64, I've never done really any optimization where I've timed register versus out of line, how big things have to be. I've never really done that performance tuning. So I don't even really know uh, what the best rule of thumb would be on any particular Intel processor, for example. Uh, let alone like an arm or something like that. Casey, just curious because the background tiles are static at the moment. Ah, uh, well, yeah, so that's because we really just haven't gotten to how we're going to put the, how we're really going to want the ground to go around the player. That's, that's just, that's just, we were just getting the compositing working, and so that's the only reason they're static. Uh, we haven't really decided how that's going to work. Well, maybe we'll look at that tomorrow. Um, do you see yourself extending random number to have anything other than a uniform distribution? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would suspect. Uh, I mean, I don't know that we'll put it necessarily, I, I'm not sure that it will go in this random set. It might, I mean, I don't know a thing about that, but when we do the procedural world generation, we'll probably want to have non-uniform distributions. So, you know, I couldn't say for sure right now, but I, I strongly suspect that yes, we will have some way of getting non-uniform distributions. However, we'll probably always start with a uniform distribution uh, so our, our, our random number generator will probably always generate uniform distributions and then we'll like warp the distributions to become non-uniform is what I suspect will happen. I don't suspect we will have like a non-uniform random number generator at the core, right? Um, that's my assumption. Is this strictly handled in RAM? Do you have plans to use GPU resources for rendering? Uh, yeah, so we will be doing the entire game with software rendering first. Uh, because that's part of the educational process. Uh, and I, I shouldn't say the entire game, but we'll, we'll have a renderer that runs entirely in software. Uh, and then later after that, we will show how to do hardware acceleration um, as a separate path. So you'll always be able to run the whole game through the software path um, and possibly some of the features in the, will be turned off in the software path uh, that aren't fast enough or something, uh, but yeah. I noticed in functions, you will always use a result variable even if the calculation is a one-liner rather than using the expression directly in the return statement. Does this incur an extra copy and are there performance implications? Uh, so no, any optimizing compiler that works at all uh, doesn't care about that performance-wise. There's no extra copy. In debug mode, there might be because in debug mode, the compiler might not do anything at all. 
Uh, but in debug mode, the compiler does so many extra copies of that form anyway that you'd never notice these. But uh, yeah, in, in optimization mode, those all go away. Uh, that's, you know, the, the SSA analysis of it would trivially trim that out. It, you know, it's, it's not a problem. The reason I do it is because that way it's easier to inspect the variables when you debug. Uh, you can always set a breakpoint before the return and see what the return is going to be without having to trust that your debugger will give you a way to view it easily. Do you plan to move all the other loaded bitmap memory to be in a memory unit as well? Uh, no. Well, yes, yes, I, uh, I should say that. Uh, uh, not now, but yes, once we do the asset loading path, that will all be memory arena based. Uh, right now it's using the debug file load stuff. So, you know, um, I believe that's how that's going. I think you've used an aggregate initializer in one place with random series being seeded, i.e. you only have one call to random seed, but you have at least two. Ah, yeah, you're right. You know what? That's a force of habit. I probably shouldn't do it. Uh, so I was trying to be a little nicer on the stream than I normally am in my real code. This is how my real code looks usually, uh, but it's, it, it's better to write it this way. Uh, so yeah, thanks for catching that. That's really what I meant to type um, rather than assuming the structure of it. So that's, that's actually, yeah, that's actually what I would have typed. Um, in my regular way that I do random series, I, I actually don't do that, but I should. It's a little bit, a little bit better. Uh, Let's see. Initially, you put bytes per pixel into the bitmap server because it can be useful. Then I asked you to remove it because it never changes, and you did that. But 10 or so episodes later, you added it back because it would be useful, and now you're removing it again. This is funny. Yeah, and that's, that's not untypical in programming, at least for me. It's like I allow things to be flexible. If I, especially there's some things where you just can't tell which way it's going to go, and they vacillate. Um, so I guess the funny thing will be, which way will it end up? Um, I think having it constant's probably right. I mean, it is constant. We're not going to allow it to be anything else. So I think probably it should have been this way. Um, when you asked me to remove it before, you were probably right. And, uh, and maybe we'll stick with it this time because we had a real reason to. Uh, you fix random to be uniform by generating a full 32-bit random number, do mod next power of two choice count, then check if result is less than choice count. If not, repeat the whole process. Oh, man. Whew. That sounds brutal, though. That's a loop, man. Yeah, we're not going to do that. Sorry. We're going to accept the, the slight bias, I'm afraid. So, all right, we are done. We have come to the end of another full power episode of Handmade Hero, which was dedicated today, actually, to Abner Combre, one of our, whose name I never know how to pronounce. This is the weird part uh, with Handmade Hero. I've made so many friends now uh, through the series. I, they can hear me say stuff, but I can never hear them say stuff. I don't know how to pronounce anyone's name, uh, even the moder moderators, I just guess when I see it. Uh, uh, but this stream, of course, was ded dedicated to Abner uh, because he had an awful day uh, the other day and uh, we were talking about it on Twitter and we decided that there should be an episode dedicated to him um, and commiserating with him for having an awful day because let's be honest, we have all had awful days at some point um, and sometimes it's nice to know that other people care about the fact that you had an awful day. Even though that doesn't help your awful day at all, like let's face it, the awful day was still awful. Uh, knowing that other people are bummed that you had an awful day can kind of help make you feel a little bit better sometimes. 
so this one's for you, Abner. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, <clears throat> I hope that, uh, that maybe future days will be better days. So let's take a look here. Where are we at? Um, <clears throat> we, have, we have come to the end of another episode of Handmade Hero. Uh, if you are someone new to the series and don't know the, don't know the drill, uh, you can uh, get access to the source code by pre-ordering the game on handmadehero.org. Uh, it comes with a link that you can use. Save the link that you get because uh, you can use it to re-download the source code. And I'm putting up a thing. I found out that SendOwl has a way to re-get links uh, if you've forgotten what yours is. So I'm going to put that up on handmadehero.org as well, kind of like under here soon. Um, I figured it out because I asked them. I was like, sometimes people lose their link and they need to get it again. How can they get it? And they said, ah, there's this hidden thing. And I was like, ah, good. We can do that. So I'm going to do that as well. Uh, and also, we've got a Patreon. Um, if you want to support the video series, you can subscribe to that. We have a news and forum site you can check out. It's got a lot of good info on it. It's got an episode guide for catching up with all the old episodes. If you, if someone who's new to the series, you can check that out. Um, every last thing we've done, every last bit of programming done on this game is there is a video that shows exactly how it was done. And that's a good place to get that. There's also community ports to Linux and Mac up there that you can check out. Uh, if you're interested in running on a different platform before we get to it officially on the series, they've already done it. Uh, and there's also a place to post questions up there. Uh, so yeah, if you're interested in the schedule, we're going to be uh, here tomorrow morning, I guess, because it's Friday tomorrow, is it not? Yeah, so it'll be uh, tomorrow at 9 a.m. We will be uh, kind of following up with the, uh, doing a little bit more of that, that ground composite work there. Uh, so tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. if you want to come back for the next episode if not we'll be starting again next week and i think next week we'll try a new time slot i was saying possibly 5 uh, 5 p.m might be the new time slot so if you're trying to keep track of all that i know it's a little crazy uh, what you want to do is take a look at the tweet bot the tweet bot's pretty good um, the tweet bot basically will tell you everything you need to know about the schedule uh, so check that out it tweets the whole schedule on weekends and it also uh, tweets every day what the schedule will be. So it should be pretty easy to keep a track. It's, it's low noise otherwise. It only tweets the schedule and any schedule related stuff that comes from me, like the time when my train was stuck and we weren't sure if I was going to get here in time. So thanks everyone for joining me. I hope to see you tomorrow. Uh, and uh, have a good Friday, whether I do or not. Take it easy, everyone.